Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to tell you about an absolutely crazy idea that I recently had. You see, every single week on the Becoming Superhuman podcast, we share with you some incredible idea that can change your life, whether that's meditation or the paleo diet or tai chi or lucid dreaming. But the thing is, how much do you actually implement in your everyday life? 10%, 20%? And you're not alone. I mean, even I, as the host of the podcast, am lucky if I implement 20 or 30% of what we talk about on the show. Why is that? Well, first off, in order to implement, we need more than a week. We need more like a month or even two months. We need community of people supporting us, cheering us on, and we need actual guidance from the experts beyond just a one-hour podcast. So I had a crazy idea. What if we got everybody together in a members-only group, and then we committed to one another that we were going to take on a new challenge every month? One month, we would all commit to lucid dreaming. Another month, we would all commit to improving our willpower. Another month, we might all try to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. So I put this idea out there and we got over a hundred people committed and involved. And here's what it looks like. In addition to a regular monthly challenge, we also send out all the gear, all the books, all the whatever that you need to complete that monthly challenge in the mail and in your email. We then have an expert, one of the 200 world-renowned experts that we've had on the show, come into the private group and teach a lesson every single week for a month so that we can actually implement what we're learning. We already have started developing the first challenges. We're working on a lucid dreaming challenge. We're working on a willpower challenge and many, many more. So I want to invite you to come try this out. Join us. There are over a hundred of us doing these challenges and we would love to have you participate with us. So to join this new crazy experiment that we're calling the Becoming Superhuman Mastermind, please visit jle.vi slash mastermind. We can't wait to see what you achieve. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. I don't have a review to read out on the air, and that's a problem. So I'm just going to pack it up and uh, go watch TV. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. But please, if you haven't left a review, I would really, really appreciate if you did. It helps us get the absolute best guests if we have lots of five-star reviews. So yeah, just do it. On to today's episode. Today, I am joined by Nicholas Sonnenberg. He is a former binary option software developer and fellow life hacker turned into a founder of a company called Leverage. Now, Nicholas is a renowned expert in productivity and life hacking, and that is largely what Leverage does, does. They are a company that helps you outsource a lot of tasks to a high-level workforce. Now, we didn't talk that much about outsourcing, but we did geek out about our favorite productivity hacks, automation hacks, and all the different things that we have managed to get off of our plate through years of learning about all these kinds of hacks. So it's a far ranging conversation. I really enjoyed talking to Nick and I know, I just know that you will enjoy the conversation. So without any further ado, Nick Sonnenberg. Nick, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. I have been really excited to chat with you because everyone that I talk to in Genius Network, when I tell them, oh, I teach a course on productivity, I'm kind of a life hacker, they're like, you should talk to Nick Sonnenberg. So I'm really excited that we're finally making that happen. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, you've already, even just before we started recording, already gave me a tip on a new cool tool. So I'm already excited to do this podcast with you. 
I tend to do that. You know, when you teach productivity and, and accelerated learning, every conversation tends to come with homework. And my friends have learned to dread hanging out with me because I send them home with a list of books. So <laughs> oh, I love that. I do the same thing with people, too. <laughs> Nick, give us a little bit of, a, of your background and bio. I know you have a past life before you got into the world of life hacking, productivity and geeking out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just, I guess, my quick bio, I was a high-frequency algorithmic trader. So that basically means I was writing computer programs and algorithms to trade stocks at really high frequencies, like uh, microsecond type of frequencies, and programmatically trade stocks for me based on my algorithms, trying to capture, you know, fractions of a penny, but, you know, doing billions and billions of dollars of volume based on my algorithms. And... I guess during that process, I was always obsessed with time, but really like while being a high frequency trader, you kind of develop an even even deeper and special kind of relationship to time and a, a greater sense of how valuable time is. Like literally a microsecond could cost, be the difference of millions, you know? And it also got me really starting to think in terms of automation too, since everything was automated. The trading was automated, the analysis was automated. You know, even the starting of my books, you would work on trying to automate that so that, you know, you could have all the sanity checks automatically done for you. You could get to work as late as possible and basically just have like a script that like will start everything, check everything, put different programs and different positions on your monitor. So I always was like, that was my background, right? And it was really like hyper focused on trading stocks, but it was still kind of the same mindset that. I've kind of taken into the productivity and business efficiency space. And now I uh, run two companies. One is Leverage, getleverage.com, which is a high-end freelancer marketplace. So we help entrepreneurs and small businesses kind of get on-demand help and extend their team without the hassle of having to search through like hundreds of thousands of people on some of those other platforms or the commitment of a W-2. So it's just really high-quality vetted people you sign up, we give you like 100 people, all different skill sets, anything to do with marketing operations or admin related tasks, or mm -hmm. mostly projects is what we're doing. Uh, my other company is a business efficiency consulting company, where I'll go into companies and help them optimize and automate their internal processes and systems. A lot of businesses don't know about tools like Slack or project management tools like Trello or Asana or internal wiki tools or process documentation tools. And even if they do, no one's kind of laid out the rules in terms of when to use which one. You know, like if I were to give right. you like a to-do item or just say to you, hey, could you do this by next week? Should I tell you that in email, Slack, or project management software, right? And one, I help them get set up with these tools. I teach them as a team since, you know, individual productivity, which we both are passionate about is relatively easy compared to business efficiency and making teams more productive because that means that you have to have coordination. And sometimes it might mean that as an individual, you sacrifice your productivity for the greater good of the team. Mm -hmm. So getting teams productive is what I do with that company that I find super interesting. That's fascinating. I mean, how'd you learn that? Because that's something that I've always struggled with. You know, it's easy to get yourself very productive, but at the end of the day, you're dependent on not just your coworkers, but also complete strangers totally. who come into your world. Where did you learn this? It all starts with individual productivity, right? Like that's the foundation of everything. So you have to, as an individual, be productive. The example that I use when I talk about this is like if you take the 2004 U.S. Men's Olympic basketball team, you have Larry Brown, who's like the best coach of all time, only coach to win an NCAA championship and an NBA championship, you have LeBron James, Carmelo Anthony, Tim Duncan, a bunch of superstars who you would say are individually productive. And then they lose to Puerto Rico in game one and then end up overall getting the bronze. So that's just kind of an illustration that it's not enough just to have a bunch of individually productive people on your team. You have to have coordination. And I learned, I kind of developed my system of this team productivity stuff through leverage, because leverage, we bootstrapped the company, we never raised money, we have no office, and we have about 100 people completely remote. 
So when you have all those types of constraints of no funding, no office, you really have to make sure that you are coordinated and efficient, you know? So totally, I practice what I preach, like everything that I do in that company, the consulting company, it's based on my own trials and errors and learnings and stuff that I do at Leverage. Incredible. Incredible. So obviously the first place I want to go is geeking out on personal productivity. Let's do it. I mean, (laughs) just like download, let's fully geek out on this, right? What are your favorite hacks? What are your favorite theories, mindset shifts? We'll go back and forth. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of simple to be honest. I'm curious to hear yours. But for me, David Allen, who wrote the book, Getting Things Done, has a great quote, which is, your brain is for having ideas, not for holding ideas. And that's kind of, to me, like the foundation of pretty much everything related to productivity. All the tricks or apps or hacks are all, to me, really to achieve that, which is get it out of your head and have some other way of capturing an idea, automating something to happen so you don't have to think about it or do it, et cetera. So to me, that's kind of like a foundational principle. Your brain's for having ideas, not for holding ideas. In terms of tricks or hacks, I would say easier said than done. And this is something that I, I coach and consult on, and, and I have a, a book and video course that includes this. But if you know how to get to inbox zero, and I'm not talking unread zero, which most people confuse inbox zero with, but if you can really maintain your inbox to having kind of less than 10, both read and unread, you know, you're, you're 90% there. Totally. I recently sat down with, um, well, I guess I won't name names, but someone on the Genius Network team, I think you know who, who gets a hundred plus thousand emails a year. And we just, we spent like two, three hours going through and it, it blew my mind, like the amount of triage. And at some point we just had to declare bankruptcy on the 157,000 emails in our inbox. And it blows my mind because to me, we're actually working on a digital declutter course right now, which is going to take many, many months. So please, folks in the audience, don't start emailing me about it. But, you know, for me, your digital life is a reflection. It's just like, you know, your physical environment is a reflection of your mental state. If your car is a mess, if your house is a mess, if your bookshelf is a mess, if your desk is a mess, your thinking is going to be a mess. And I think the same is true. I mean, more and more, like when was the last time you actually sat for three hours and wrote, hand wrote on your desk? So more and more, your desktop, your email inbox, your Asana inbox is the actual workspace, which reflects your mindset. At least that's my philosophy. No, totally. And the way that you do one thing is the way that you do everything, right? So if one thing is a mess, if your room is a mess, your inbox is probably a mess too. I love it. I'll fire back with one that I really, really love, which Joe Polish always talks about when he interviewed Ariana Huffington, which is just the power of saying no. And the best way to get something off your to-do list is to delete it. And I think no is the most productive word in the English language because it pushes off obligations that you don't need. And whether that's no, I'm not going to reply to this email because you know what? I don't need to send a reply saying, okay, or no, I'm not going to take that call you know, I find that the most productivity I get is actually in the things that I don't do. Totally. The whole concept of not to do this is great because for everything that you say yes to, you're saying no to an infinite number of other things, right? So it's super important to be clear on what you say no to. Dan Sullivan has a really good, the founder of Strategic Coach, has a whole philosophy around your unique ability, right? Mm -hmm. And we really carry that over into leverage too. Like when people are like coming to us asking or not sure what they should be outsourcing, We always say to people, anything that you don't get pleasure from or that doesn't tap into your unique ability, you should be thinking about how to not do it, right? And it doesn't always have to be, I say the pleasure thing, right? Because there's some things you don't want to outsource because you like to do it. So if you get joy from something, keep it. But if there's something that you don't like doing and your time is worth a hundred bucks an hour, right? If you can get it off your plate and pay someone 50 bucks an hour, that's a time arbitrage right there. So People just don't realize nowadays how many things they could have on their not to do list. People really have this idea that only they can do things. Right. Nowadays, you can outsource so much. Like, I outsourced my first book, Idea to Execution. I probably spent 25 hours on that book and I got fourth on Forbes last year for business books. 
Wow. You wrote it with uh, Scribe? A hybrid of Scribe. And then I kind of had my own process where I used an app called Dropbox. Not Box with a B. V, Dropbox with a V. And that's a um, audio recording tool that connects to a Dropbox folder. So what I did was every day I would brain dump content mm-hmm. into this app. It would go to a Dropbox folder. Then I set up, there's a tool called Zapier, which is an automation tool. I'm sure you're, you know that one. Oh, yes. We do 150,000 tasks a month on Zapier. I would love to compare that with you. I mean, literally Zapier, like we were able to avoid raising money with leverage because we so aggressively use Zapier. Yeah. Um, so anyways, when an audio file got added to that Dropbox folder, Zapier would get triggered to notify a writer on my team and give them the link to listen to it, summarize it, put the summary in an Evernote document. So after about six or nine months, that Evernote document was like really robust. And then we handed that over to Scribe, did their thing. After a couple months with them, got a rough draft. And then on my podcast, I announced if anyone would like to be a first reader, they could do it in exchange for giving feedback. So I stuck it in a Google Doc in suggestion mode and got 12 people to crowdsource the editing. Brilliant. You're on a different level, man. We're going to be really, really good friends. (laughs) (laughs) That is awesome. Here I am. I'm writing my book with Scribe like a sucker. (laughs) Well, no, I'm doing another book right now with Scribe too. And I'm spending way more time than I did the first time. I'm really enjoying it. I have to say. They have a good process. What I've done actually for this book, different process At Leverage, we have writers as well. But Scribe, we have a partnership actually with Scribe or we get a special pricing because they're so hyper-focused on outsourcing books. So what I've done is I've taken my ghostwriter internally who writes all my ink articles for me, which that's all. I've taken writing ink articles to a whole other deal. I'll tell you that right after this. But I've gotten my ghostwriter for ink articles to join all the calls with Scribe. So I have my ghostwriter at Leverage on all the calls with Scribe. Brilliant. Brilliant. What else do you outsource in your personal life? Because I think, so first, kind of a tangent, but people tend to look at outsourcing as one of two things. First, only for businesses. Second, kind of a stuck up thing to do. Like when I tell people I don't actually cook anymore, I have someone come. It's not expensive. It sounds expensive. I have someone come and cook. I send out my laundry. I have someone clean the house. I don't do a lot of my emails. I don't do my social media posting. I mean, I outsource a lot. And people look at that with their nose in the air. But the reality is I save so much time and it's the best money that I spend because it literally buys me the most happiness. So I'm curious to hear what are the things that you outsource in your personal life? So let me just finish up with the ink article thing, then I'll go to personal. But for me, I don't really think about things like, oh, I'm outsourcing for work, I'm outsourcing for business. For me, it's all about work-life integration. And if I save a minute, it doesn't really matter where that minute is saved, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to save time, which, however, whichever section of my life I'm saving time. So with my ink articles, I'm a writer for ink. What I was doing at first, which was already a pretty cool process, I find the audio recorder on your phone to be a really good hack that most people aren't taking advantage of. So if you're in like a a car, and this doesn't have to just be applied to ink, but if you're saying a taxi, Uber, car, etc, walking, brain dump ideas for content or anything that you might need and record it in the audio recording and then send that to a ghostwriter to do something with it. So what I was doing for ink articles was I was waiting till I was in cabs and I would come up with content And I would just brain dump in a 10 minute cab content and um, send that to my writer who would then write it and publish it on ink and then send it to my marketing team at at Leverage. Now what I've been doing is I've just been introducing my ghostwriter via email to interesting people and telling them (laughs) connect and write an article on whatever you'd like. (laughs) And the article comes out under your name. It's under my name. I literally, I enjoy reading my own articles because like, I don't even know what they're about. So I mean, that's like really outsourcing for personal, you know, hiring a housekeeper is outsourcing, right? Uh, Having someone do your laundry is outsourcing. So those are like the typical things I'm doing every week for personal. Um, But for me, anything that where I can be saving time. And at first, the tricky thing 
with outsourcing in general is this belief that, you know, only you can do it. And even if you can do something really, you're the best at it. You know, if you could get someone to do it, 80% is good. Most of the time that's good enough. And it's worth the trade off of all the time freed up for you to do things that you're way better at. I explained this to someone today where they're like, you know, we had kind of a disagreement over some work that got done and this, that, and the other. And he kind of said, you know, if you had done this, it would have been better. I don't think this is up to your standard. And I said, it's 80% as good as I would have done and I didn't have to do it. And I was trying to explain, you know, like the incredible value of that because while that was getting done, I was writing a new book, which up until five minutes ago, I thought that only I could do, but now I realize I don't even have to do that if I'm on the the Nick Sonnenberg level of outsourcing. <laughs> oh, here's a trick with the book that I've been doing with my... So Aiden on my team that joins those calls... Sometimes when you're writing the book with Scribe, you might get to a point where it's like, oh, some research would be really good to support that or something like that. Sometimes it might be, hey, you know, there was something in this book and we should be taking a few clips from this book. So sometimes I'll go and have Aiden literally read a book to find good examples to insert in my book that I'm doing with Scribe. Wow. That's next level. I love that. I really love that. You know, one that I've been really passionate about lately And I haven't fully found a solution. I think the solution might be the MX Platinum um, Concierge. But I've realized that planning trips takes a lot of time. And I'm not very good at it. And I don't enjoy it. And so I really want someone to just plan trips for me. I think it would be an amazing idea. Like you and I both have Bluefish, which is like a super high level concierge. But unless you want to do five star resorts and really luxury trips. It's not a good fit for your everyday kind of travel. So that's something I'm really passionate about and need to get off my plate soon. Yeah. Travel is like probably one of the trickier ones. I still book most of my travel. I don't outsource too much of it. Some of it I do. I tend to try to outsource things that I'm going to get like a really good return on time. You know, everyone talks about return on investment, but for me, return on time is what I'm thinking about. So I'm always trying to outsource something. Like, what could I spend two minutes to give to someone that saves me two hours? Right. Sometimes travel, there's so much back and forth that will need to go into it. Like, does this flight work? This hotel, this time, this price? That in the end, when you like kind of like net out how much time you're going to need to spend talking to the freelancer, the time saved versus spent isn't usually... I haven't found it to be the best ratio compared to other things that I outsource. Interesting. Yeah, I've heard that. And people have told me that I'm still not giving up, though. (laughs) Yeah, at Leverage, we do travel stuff, too. And we do a lot of it. So you could always try that. But yeah, it's tricky. You know, it's really tricky because it's going to always involve some minimum amount of your time. Mm -hmm. All right. At this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor for Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, and I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15 percent discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. So coming back, productivity hacks and tricks, what are some other things that you do to shave off time? I mean, we've covered some really good ones, Zapier, we've covered text-to-speech and stuff like that. Any other stuff that you're doing that's saving you tons and tons of time every day? It's really like the sum of many small things. Like I'm not trying to save like an hour in one shot, right? Like I'm getting excited to save like five seconds or a second. Same. 
<laughs> so, you know, like things like even like the Amazon Echo, right? Like that's a great 40 buck thing that everyone could get right now that will save you a few seconds a day, maybe a minute a day just by asking it questions. Right. And or just having it order stuff for you if you're based in the US, like Echo or Hey Alexa, just order me toilet paper. Yeah, totally. What else? Well, I always try to automate things before outsourcing, right? Because a computer, if you can use Zapier, it's basically free. It'll never screw up, never get tired, way more scalable. So take a look at Zapier, like little things like reminding your team about a meeting. Yep. You can automate that and have a message and via Zapier, go to the Slack channel. Yep. So anything that a computer could do, and if you're not sure if a computer could do it, just take a look at Zapier. I always try to do first and then, you know, I just aggressively outsource things. Totally. Totally. I mean, I look to outsource and automate in that same order and sometimes over automate. I mean, I'll automate a product that I don't even know we're going to be selling next month, but we just launched our mastermind and the behind the scenes magic of so many different things. I mean, we're now figuring out a way to connect it so that when someone signs up, their welcome package is automatically FedEx to them and no human being needs to deal with it. It just gets printed out and gets a label and there it goes, you know? So I'm a big, big fan of Zapier. We, we should do a comparison of our best uh, Zapier recipes. Oh, another trick too. Here's one that everyone could do. Buy URLs that are easy to remember, right? Yes. So like, talk to jonathan.com, right? And then have that point to Calendly or whatever you use for mm -hmm. your scheduling meetings so it's easy to remember. And you can do that with Zoom, right? It could be like Zoom with Jonathan or whatever. So wherever you could buy a URL and have the domain forwarding and point to the service that you want, that's a cool little hack that I do quite a bit. Love that. Do you know uh, Pretty Link by any chance? No, what is Pretty Link? So I have to be careful here not to give real links that I use, but Pretty Link allows you to create your own version of Bitly on your own WordPress server. So my website is jle.vi, which is a nice short one. And if you go to, I'm going to make these up so people don't actually click these, jle.vi slash call. It books a call with me, jle.vi slash friend discount. It's a friend discount for my courses, jle.vi slash dinner, books a dinner appointment with me, jle.vi slash call 30, 30 minute call, call 60, 60 minute call, and on and on and on and on and on and on. Like JLE, yep. here's one people can try, jle.vi slash mastermind. That's our private membership group. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. So yeah. A uh, strategy around short URLs or easy to remember URLs is always a good one. One zap that I did that you might want to do for your book, I set up a short URL. I'm not going to tell people what the URL is, but I had that point to a Wufu form. So you could, if you're meeting someone, you want to give out your book, you give them like this free book URL, have it point to a Wufu form. When they fill out the Wufu form, that will, through Zapier, update a Google spreadsheet. And at the same time, send an email to my friend at wind.it, which is a shipping company, who I was storing a lot of books at their warehouse. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is they would print out a sticker label, uh, customize it to the person's name, stick it to the front cover of the book, and ship it whenever someone would fill out that form. Love it. So I automated the shipping of books that I wanted to give away for free. That's the dream. That's what we're trying to do with... Um, we're going to use disc.com, which is a fellow Genius Network member. Yep. Yeah. So you could do the same thing with, with Joe Foley there. Love it. Love it. These are really, really good. Let's go. <laughs> One more. Do you know a uh, better touch tool? Better touch tool? No. I'm going to have to start pushing back and ask you a bunch of things in a second. Let me look this one up, though. I'm a fiend, man. Better touch tool I use to do... It's for Mac, but I used to do finger shortcuts for different things. So for example, instead of going to reply or hitting the reply button or whatever, I just drag three fingers right, reply to a mail, drag three fingers left, the mail's deleted, drag three fingers up, it's forwarded. I've got all kinds of like finger shortcuts, you know, that like if I uh, swirl my fingers gotcha. in a certain pattern, it opens new windows. And then another one that I use religiously is Quicksilver. 
I'm not using that either. Oh, man. Quicksilver allows you to have a typing interface to your entire computer, so you can hit a hotkey. For me, it's just the function key. It opens up a search to your whole computer, and then you can interact with that piece of information. So, for example, I can hit function, type Nick Sonnenberg, tab, email, tab, and then pick a file, and it'll just email you the file. So I don't even have to open my email client to email you a file or text message you or what's another example you can resize images so if someone's like hey can you send me that image i can resize it and email it without ever opening the image editing app without ever opening the email app it's pretty cool okay so i have a competitor to that so here's some suggestions or here's some of the things i have on my computer have you heard of little snitch no all right so little snitch it's for like it security Mm -hmm. So it can protect, like your computer is sending out packets of information that you're not even aware of. So this Mm -hmm. can let you know who you're sending that to and you can block certain places to get it. And it also has a launch bar product in there. So um, the launch bar is kind of similar to what you just said. There's one that I use religiously though. Have you ever used Cloud? What's it called? Cloudapp.com. It sounds familiar, but no. So... We get a discount. I'll send it to you. I don't remember what, what the code is. Probably if you mention leverage to them, but I'll send it to you so you can give it out to your audience and put in the show notes. Cloud app is a screenshotting tool like on steroids. So instead of taking a screenshot from the built-in screenshot and then it has to download to your downloads and then you have to re-upload the screenshot to wherever you want to go, mm-hmm. it uploads it to the cloud, creates a, a URL, and it's in your cache memory. So you could take a a screenshot and then hit command V and paste the URL immediately in your conversation without having to go through those extra three steps. You could also, if you do command shift A with cloud app, it takes a screenshot, but then you can annotate on it. So especially if you're in, in teams and you're collaborating or you want to document a process, which we really recommend process street, which again, if people are interested in using that tool, we have a a big discount with them. I'll, I'll give you that documenting process or just explaining things like, you know, we have an app that we just launched, the amount of feedback or bugs or things that you need to communicate with your developers on a daily basis is staggering. And you need to be taking screenshots and pointing to different things to explain like, hey, or putting boxes around things explaining this is what's wrong. So just hitting command shift A, screenshot, point to what's wrong, save, it's saved as a URL, and then command V and the developer has the annotated screenshot, that really ends up saving a lot of time in cumulative. That's a pretty good one. I mean, I use, I don't even remember what it's called. I have this little screeny that I can see all my screenshots. And of course I use Hazel, which I hope you know about, to automatically delete the screenshots after a certain period of time and reorganize files automatically and as you can tell, you and I have to have lunch next time we're both in Arizona and just bring our computers yeah. and go, wait, what, what was that? What was that? Hold on. What was that? Yeah, there's one that I haven't, I just downloaded. I haven't tried yet. I think it's called Mirror, yeah, Magnet for Apple desktops. And you could start saving applications in different quadrants of your screen. So then when you like load up your computer, you could have chrome just in the top left quadrant or you could have spotify in the bottom right and it saves it so better touch tool can do that and i can do that with finger shortcuts so for example four fingers tap goes full screen three fingers click swipe left goes left side of the screen right side of the screen we'll do a session i think you'll get a real kick out of it (laughs) sounds similar you know in my experience a lot of people don't even realize that if you're on a mac I'm biased to Max. If course. whatever application you're on, if you hit the green button that expands it to full screen, that basically gives you a whole other computer monitor and you can swipe three fingers right and left to get from one screen to another. And a lot of people don't even know about that trick, which you don't have to install anything to take advantage of that. Right. You're talking about different desktops, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like I use anything that I use a lot, like Skype, I use a lot. I have a different Chrome instance for my personal versus leverage versus my consulting. Oh, smart. So then I can just swipe three fingers from one desktop to another to kind of get into that session that I need to get into. That's smart. I should do that more. I used to use desktops, but then they kind of changed it. And 
and I don't use it anymore, but that's really smart to just have. I mean, that's a really big takeaway for people is just have every app that you need for a certain kind of work. So for example, for my book writing, I could just have all the tabs open that I need in that desktop. Whereas if I'm dicking around, you know, watching Netflix, that can be a different desktop. And then I guess you just never shut your laptop down. You just leave those desktops active. I just leave those active. You know, if you really like to do everything from one browser and one instance, then there's Chrome extensions like Workano, where then you could kind of save sessions based on personal work, finance, etc. And then you could like launch a bunch of tabs at once related to what you're looking at. Speaking of Chrome extensions, a couple that I really recommend, there's one called Tab Suspender, so that if you're inactive on a tab, it kind of puts it to sleep, so it's not taking up your computer energy. Mm-hmm. That's probably the, the number one one that I'm liking right now. I love it. So Nick, I know we're surprisingly coming up on time already. I want to ask you, what's some homework that we can give people or an experiment that they can try at home to start automating, outsourcing, and getting more productive today while they're feeling inspired? All right. So easy things to do is like get an Echo Dot or Alexa. And that's an easy one. I haven't watched your course, but from just the sound of it, it sounds like everyone should watch your course (laughs) for sure. Thank you. Take a look at the ink articles I've written and my book, Idea to Execution. Read David Allen's book. Even though it's old now, there's still good nuggets in there. Tim Ferriss's book, 4-Hour Workweek, is a good one too. So I would read all that. Also, take a look at your calendar. And I mean, we could just do a whole session just on how to use a calendar properly, right? Mm -hmm. But take a look at where you're spending time in your calendar and just kind of try to reflect you know, is that really how you want to be spending your time? And try to... Different people have different ways of using it. Some people like to block out time for reading or for personal time, etc. But optimizing your calendar is a really big one. I like to run my calendar like an arrow. So meaning like I stack my Mondays really condensed. And then each day, I kind of only allow little by little less meetings. So Friday, I kind of try to leave as open as possible. That way, as things come up at the beginning of the week, I have more flexibility to take care of it at the end of the week. Another trick with calendars is if you're using any calendar, but I use Google, you can change the default duration of events. I think for some reason, their default is like one hour. So I've changed my default to 15 minutes. And what that does is when you hit create event, it makes it a little bit harder. If you want to make it longer than 15 minutes, you've just created some friction for yourself and people are lazy and any extra click decreases the probability of it happening. So I always suggest make your event durations 15 minutes and make it so you have to go out of your way to do a a meeting longer than that. And you'll find that you you kind of fill the space that you allocate. So if you put an hour meeting, you'll figure out a way to talk for an hour. But if you make it 15 minutes, you'll probably accomplish everything you wanted to, for the most part, this doesn't always work, right? Sometimes you do have to extend it. But in general, you can kind of get as much done in shorter periods of time. And you just having a shorter meeting forces you to be more efficient. I love that. That's really, really smart. And speaking of how you use your time, do you know rescue time? Yeah, I tried it a while ago. I mean, I think that for certain people, that's a great tool to use. There's other competitors to rescue time too, to analyze kind of where you're spending time. There's a physical product that connects via Bluetooth. I'm blanking on the name. And apparently that's even more accurate and uh, more detailed than Rescue Time. And I'm just blanking on what it is. But yeah, I think data and analysis and self-reflection is always a good thing. Knowing where you're spending time is a good thing. You know, that's why I think it's important that you keep up your calendar. So if you ever want to kind of go back and analyze where you're spending time, you can just take a quick look at it. Totally. What I love about Rescue Time, we have half our staff on the pro plan. And if anyone wants to check it out, here's an example of a short link, jle.vi slash rescue time. And I think people get a free month through us. But I have it actually block me out of shit. So I'm not allowed to be on Slack and do all kinds of distracting work on Sundays and Wednesdays. Those are writing days. So it just, after 15 minutes, blocks me out. If I'm on Facebook for more than 15 minutes a day total, any day, it just blocks me out, which has proved a problem now that I'm in our mastermind group and kind of encouraging people and leading challenges on Facebook. 
Yeah. Now the iPhone has that built in so you can like set time limits and on apps, which is something I've been using too. Yeah, it's phenomenal screen time for those who haven't checked it out. If we haven't given people enough of a laundry list of apps to download, which reminds me, Nick, tell us about leverage and how people can use it, what they should use it for. I mean, I got a full crash course from your wonderful staff at Genius Network, but uh, explain to folks why they should use leverage and why, even if they're not some big high price CEO, this is something they should definitely check out. So... The way it works is we basically give you vetted freelancers as a team and we handle anything to do with marketing, operations. So marketing could be creating content like writing an ink article, writing content for a blog or social media, creating sales funnels for you, designing you a presentation deck. So whenever I give a talk, they design the talk. If you need some websites built or apps built, we can do that too. In terms of operations, we could help you get set up with a CRM like Salesforce. We could create you a Slack bot custom to connect to your CRM so that it gives you certain information that you might want. We can help you set up a tool like Process Street to document and automate your processes, et cetera, et cetera. I would, one, really think about what is your time worth? Is it $20 an hour, $50 an hour, $100 an hour, et cetera? And whatever it is, you know, try to find ways to arbitrage your time. So Mm -hmm. for admin tasks, we charge $40 an hour billed to the second. So you purchase credits and we hit start and stop timers. So you can see how many seconds we spent on it. For marketing and operations tasks, it's $80 an hour. So clearly, if your time is worth more than $80 an hour, you're clearly getting a time arbitrage by using us. Even say your time is worth $70 an hour, if you absolutely hate doing, say, writing, it's still worth it to consider either leverage or some other service. But you know, you also have to take into account, do you enjoy what you're doing? And what's the value of that when you're looking at these things? Right. And leverage isn't the only one, you know, you can take a look at Upwork, there's like, we created leverage because I found it very time consuming in Upwork, because you inevitably need to hire like five to 10 different types of freelancers. And then you end up having to do the coordination between these people since they're not part of the same team. And if you're not happy with someone's work, you're fighting with some individual on the other side of the world. That's why I created Leverage. But Upwork is a good place to look. Fiverr is another place that you can look for things. There's a bunch of just like virtual assistant companies overseas that are cheap that you might be able to find success with. A lot of it's hit or miss. I typically really try to outsource things where I get that return on time that we were talking about. Like, what can I explain in one minute and save a few hours, right? I find that the least successful types of things to outsource is like book me a dentist appointment. And it takes you two minutes to explain who your dentist is and your schedule to someone. And you just basically, instead of you spending the two minutes to call yourself, you've just spent the two minutes to have someone else do it, and you're not really saving all that much time. Sure. So really think about things like, and Joe Polish that you mentioned before, and he has like a quote, like what's like one thing that can unlock like a hundred other things? So same with this, like what's something where I can spend as little time as possible and save as much time as possible? That's why audio recording is a good one because typically in like a cab, it's kind of dead time anyways. So mm-hmm. It's costing you very little to audio record in a cab. Like I was in West Hollywood once going to LAX. I updated my whole company vision in that 40 minute Uber ride because I just kept talking into an audio and then I sent it to my writer. I'm like, hey, update the company vision and send it to the whole team. So there's so much that you can do with audio. Now, is a ghostwriter an example of a task? Because I think when people hear a ghostwriter, they think dollar signs. Is that an example of a task that leverage can get done for 80 bucks an hour? Yeah, again, it's it's built to the second. So I mean, if they only spend 10 minutes and 34 seconds, right? That's what comes out of your credits. And yeah, we have some excellent, excellent writers. Like, just take a look, you know, look up Nick Sonnenberg Space Inc. on Google, and you can see all my ink articles. I haven't written a single one. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> Nick, This has been an absolute blast. I definitely want to make sure that you and I grab some time to wrap in the future next time we are in Arizona together. 
give people the links that they can check out all this various stuff one more time, though we will put it at superhuman.blog slash podcast. The main website is getleverage.com, G-E-T-L-E-V-E-R-A-G-E.com. And that's where you can find me and you know all the information you would need on outsourcing. Awesome. Nick, I want to thank you. But before I do that, let me first ask you, if people remember one big takeaway from this episode and they carry that with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? Hmm. Well, can I give a couple? <laughs> yeah, please. All right. So your brain is for having ideas, not holding ideas is one. Think about return on time. What can you spend one minute to save 100 minutes? And also think about what's your hourly rate and what can you time arbitrage? I love it. These are great. Nick Sonnenberg, thank you very, very much for spending your time and energy with us today. I know how preciously you guard it, so I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the hell out of this conversation, and I know our audience did too. Same here. We'll have to get you on the Leverage Podcast. All right, let's do it. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today, but I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.